a good morning, Roseville Church. Um, it's a pleasure to be with you all this morning and to be opening God's Word. Um, we'll be reading from Psalm 77, so if you want to start making your way there now. Um, I just want to uh, put this question in your minds right from the outset and just sort of let it uh, sit there and gestate and turn over in your mind as we go through this passage. Um, where do you turn when you're in turmoil? Where do you turn when you're in turmoil? When things uh, are not as they should be, where do you go? Um, I'll explain more of kind of what I mean by that, but first I want to give just, yeah, a, a, a a few of my own introductions. Uh, like Randy said, I am Brendan DeFilippo, a student at McMaster Divinity College. I am a, a friend of some of the pastoral staff uh, that you've seen here today, and I may or may not be dating someone that you may or may not have seen up here leading worship. And I do hope that by process of elimination you can guess uh, who that might be. Um, now they say that you you never get a second chance at a first impression. Uh, so I'm going to go out on a bit of a limb here with this introduction, and I'm going to tell you about the first time that I went driving on the 401. Okay, I was young, which when someone tells you that in that tone of voice, you know they're about to say that they did something stupid. Uh, I'll just say that I've always been pretty comfortable behind the wheel, sometimes maybe too comfortable. I learned this uh, right from the get-go, from the very first time I traveled alone on the highway. I was 18, I was going to a job fair in London, I grew up just south of there, and I was, uh, you might say, absolutely in the zone. Um, now. Some of you, whether you love driving or not, can remember when you first started and you know exactly what I mean. Like, I was basically st still just a child, but the government had just given me permission to own and operate this powerful piece of machinery. Uh, in my case, it was a 97 Mercury Mystique. Uh, it was bright teal, but it may as well have been a fully loaded Dodge Charger. Like, I was suddenly, in my own mind, the coolest person on the face of the planet. And so I would just cruise around town, windows down, classic rock, blaring, and just convinced that every pedestrian was just, had their jaw hit the pavement when they saw me go by because of my coolness and just um, killer taste in music. Now, uh, the, very f the fact that it was all my dad's music and poorly recorded from CDs back onto cassettes is beside the point. I was in the zone. That didn't matter. And this is how I drove into London that day. I was going to a job fair. I was hopefully going to get my first full-time job after high school. Uh, life is good. I'm cruising along. I'm rocking out to Kansas or Peter Gabriel or something like that. And... Suddenly, I sort of come to my senses, and I all of a sudden notice, wait, these signs above the highway, they don't say London, they say Toronto. Wait, no. No, could I really have zoned out for two extra hours? I mean, I, I can get, I can lose track of time. I can be forgetful, but I mean, I guess, I don't know, this is my first time. I haven't set the clock in my car yet. I mean, maybe, I don't know. And so, not actually knowing how to turn around on the 401 at that time, this was all very well planned, by the way, um, <laughs> as you can see, I, I soon found myself lost in an absolute labyrinth of one-way streets uh, and, and areas that I could not recognize. And... This is not what I expected when I set out that morning. This was, in fact, the opposite. And what I then experienced for the next hour or so, I can only describe as turmoil. And let me clarify. When I say turmoil, I don't just mean emotions. 
this includes thoughts in, and, most importantly, actions. It, it, it's the experience of being unsettled and confused, and it's often connected to our situation, our circumstances. In this life, we find ourselves thrust into situations where our beliefs, our understanding, just isn't adequate to explain our experience. They just don't seem to line up with reality and nothing makes sense. And in these situations, we don't know what to think, what to feel, what to do. And this is what I mean by turmoil. And being stuck in a state of turmoil can cause us to doubt our core beliefs, question our identity, uh, and even cause us deep emotional pain and confusion. And we all experience this, or have or will experience this, so the question is, for all of us, where do you turn in times of turmoil? Where do you find peace? Where do you find stability? Where do you go for grounding in times of turmoil? Today's passage, Psalm 77, is all about facing turmoil from the standpoint of faith. This psalm was uh, what's called a communal lament. Now, that means that Israel, uh, ancient Israel, would sing this in their worship, and they would reflect back on the time when they were sent into exile in Babylon. This, that's what's in the background of this psalm. It, it's the ultimate time of turmoil in Israel's history. God had promised to take them into the land of Canaan, out of slavery. He did, but then he took them right back out. And their expectations were under, undermined by their experiences. But this psalm was actually written much earlier in the time of David uh, by a single individual. His name was Asaph. Asaph was the chief musician to the King David. He was a worship leader. And in this psalm, he's wrestling very personally with the question of how he can turn to God in the midst of his turmoil. And through this process, he discovers four ways that turmoil, far from destroying faith, is actually a means by which we can grow and flourish in our faith. So if you have your Bibles with you, let's turn to Psalm 77. I'm going to read from the ESV translation. You're welcome to follow along in one that you're more familiar with, but Let's read the whole psalm together, starting at verse 1. I cry aloud to God, aloud to God, and he will hear me. In the day of my trouble, I seek the Lord. In the night, my hand is stretched out without wearying. My soul refuses to be comforted. When I remember God, I moan. When I meditate, my spirit faints. You hold my eyelids open. I am so troubled that I cannot speak. I consider the days of old, the years of long ago. I said, let me remember my song in the night. Let me meditate in my heart. And then my spirit made a diligent search. Will the Lord spurn forever and never again be favorable? Has, has his steadfast love forever ceased? Are his promises at an end for all time? Has God forgotten to be gracious? Has he in anger shut up his compassion? And then I said, I will appeal to this, to the years of the right hand of the Most High. I will remember the deeds of the Lord. Uh, yes, I will remember the wonders of old. I will ponder all your work, and I will meditate on your mighty deeds. Your way, O Lord, O God, is holy. What God is great like our God? You are the God who works wonders. You have made known your might among the peoples. You, with your arm, redeemed your people, the children of Joseph and Jacob. When the waters saw you, O God, when the waters saw you, they were afraid. Indeed, the deep trembled. The clouds poured out water. The skies gave forth thunder. Your arrows flashed on every side. The crash of your thunder was in the whirlwind, and your lightnings lit up the world. The earth trembled and shook. Your way was through the sea, and your path was on the great waters, and yet your footprints were unseen. You led your people like a flock by the hand, 
of Moses and Aaron. At the very beginning of this psalm, Asaph describes what he's going through as the day of my trouble, or that's how my translation puts it. Uh, the word actually in Hebrew is stronger than that. It, it comes from this root word meaning to wrap or to bind or even to be, to be cramped. Uh, you can think of like a straight jacket that's designed to hold you in place and, and constrain you. It's the idea of something that is too tight or doesn't fit. So Asaph is saying, this situation that I'm in, it, it doesn't make any sense in my belief system. I feel like I am trying to fit a square peg in a round hole. And in this sense, we could translate the word anguish, or I prefer turmoil. Uh, Asaph goes on to say that his soul and his spirit feel weak and near to fainting. At his very core, Asaph is coming apart at the seams. But why? What's the cause? I mean, Asaph doesn't actually tell us what situation he's in that's making him experience this, but it's actually not the point. And Asaph goes on to tell us this much. Uh, the, the real thing that's causing his pain is actually the very thought of God. That's what's keeping him awake at night. That's what's crushing his soul. Now, why would that be? I mean, shouldn't, shouldn't the thought of God, the God of Israel, be comforting for his chosen people? Well, not necessarily. You see, for Asaph, like Israel in exile, God's very promises have become a source of pain because the situation he's in seems to contradict them. But notice something else. Asaph is not in a posture of despair or defeat. He's not lying in bed. He's not slumping to the floor. He's not staying up till 3 a.m. playing video games uh, for many reasons. Uh, but he, what he's doing is he's sitting upright with his hands outstretched, and he's telling all of this to God. Despite all of his pain and turmoil, Asaph is confident that God can resolve it. And so he brings it to him again and again. He says, day and night. And he refuses to accept that turmoil is the end of the matter. So here Asaph is showing us the first way, the first step, that we can turn to God in times of turmoil. We can pray in the midst of our pain. We can pray in the midst of our pain. We can honestly tell God very brutal truths if we need to. God, it seems like you are the problem here. You set my expectations. You led me into this situation. And now it seems like you haven't followed through. That sort of thing is hard to admit. But it's a necessary starting point because this kind of honesty before God is actually an act of confident faith that although God might seem to be the problem he must really be the solution and he can be trusted enough to seek it with him and in verses 4 to 9 this is exactly what Asaph starts to do he starts to dig deeper to find this solution he says let me remember my song in the night now that the term here for song uh, is not just talking about singing or vocals. It's actually referring to stringed music. So I think Asaph is reflecting here on his own experiences, his own past of leading worship with Israel in the congregation. The, the, the term days of old and years long ago are actually describing his own personal memories as a worship leader of happier times, of the good old days. Asaph here is showing us the second way that we can turn to God in times of turmoil. We can remember our personal experiences of God's goodness. We can remember our personal experiences of God's goodness. Here Asaph turns back to his own memories of a time when God was faithful to him. 
uh, this reminds him of the pattern of God's faithfulness that he's experienced over the course of his life. But interestingly, this doesn't actually solve the problem. In verses 7 and 8, we see it actually raises more questions for Asaph, and pretty substantial ones, too. Has his steadfast love forever ceased? Okay, for an Israelite, this is a massive question. The word love in Hebrew here is chesed. Um, if you haven't noticed by now, I have a bit of a love for languages, so uh, to use a VeggieTales reference, this could easily become the part of the show where Brendan nerds out about Hebrew grammar. But that's not going to happen because y'all have places to be, and um, I don't want you to get dehydrated as I ramble on for an hour and a half. I'll just say that this word love is really important in the Old Testament. It's talking about the love that God showed to Israel when he made his covenants with Abraham, with Moses, with David, and he promised to be committed to Israel forever. So in other words, Asaph is questioning the very foundations of his faith in God, his identity as one of the chosen people, even interrogating God's own reliability. Now, at this point, we might think, uh, for all appearances, that Asaph's faith is faltering, that he's just giving in to what we today might call uh, deconstruction. But notice that, once again, he's not doing this on his own, and he's not hiding any of this from God. He is boldly bringing these doubts, these questions, into God's presence, and instead of running from uncomfortable questions, he confronts them. Asaph has actually made some progress. See, by digging into his own memory, by remembering the pattern of God's faithfulness to him, he can now identify the real questions that are causing him turmoil, the real deeper issues he's dealing with. God, you acted faithfully in the past. I know that. So what has changed? Did I sin? Are you angry? Are you not telling me? <laughs> Are you forgetful? Is that even possible? Are you unreliable? Heaven forbid. But honest questions can be a faithful response in times of turmoil. Asaph doesn't stop here. He isn't content to settle with skepticism or deconstruction. In verses 10 to 15, he digs even deeper. And starting in verse 10, we finally reach a turning point. We see a shift in Asaph's thinking. He says, I will remember the deeds of the Lord. See, right here, Asaph identifies the real problem that he's been dealing with. It, it turns out the ultimate source of his turmoil was not his circumstances, bad as they may be, but his perspective on them. I mean, yes, he's in a tumultuous situation. So was Israel in the exile. I'm not denying that, that these things affect us. But the true source of his angst and his unsettledness in his faith is actually coming from his interpretation. Asaph needs to remember something. But that implies <clears throat> that implies that he's been forgetting something up till this point. And what is it? Asaph has been forgetting God's actions the things God has done. And this actually shows up in the language of the whole psalm. You can see it. For the first nine verses, he's focused on his own experiences. My distress, my heart, my soul, my spirit. But then from verse 10 onward, we see a shift. His attention is now on your deeds, your wonders, your strength, and your way. 
There's even a shift in the name of God that Asaph is using. Everywhere else it's generic, God, God, God. But here, when you see the word Lord in all capitals in your Bible, the, name, the word is actually Yahweh. And this is the name that God used to reveal himself to Israel when he took them out of Egypt. So, in other words, what Asaph realizes here is not that he needs to just remember his theology and a bunch of facts about God. Specifically, he needs to remember God's redemptive actions to, towards Israel, the things God has done to save his people. In other words, Asaph needs to shift his attention from his experience to the scriptures, to the Bible. I mean, this is a little uncomfortably relatable, isn't it? I mean, we have all experienced this and do continually. We forget who God is because we lose sight of the things he has done. And we default just automatically to ideas about God that we find comfortable or familiar. Now, these are good things. They might be ideas we formed in Bible college. They might be our parents' beliefs that we've inherited, those of our denomination or our, our, our tradition's official stance on things. All good, but not when they replace Scripture as the source of our perspective that we keep coming back to. And times of turmoil have a way of shining a light on how inadequate just simple answers can be. Asaph's example here is a challenge for us to encounter God in a third way. We can reflect on God's redemptive actions in Scripture. But note the, note the wording. Uh, Asaph isn't simply telling us to read more Scripture. I mean, he is. Um, not to simply memorize more verses or read the events, but he wants us to reflect on their meaning. The word he uses here is meditate. In Hebrew, you can translate this as mutter. Um, muttering. Um, if you can't hear me right now, if the sound system isn't working per particularly well, maybe that's what I sound like. I'm muttering. Uh, but it's this idea of chewing on an idea. Chewing on a, an image or an idea, like a, like a tough piece of gristle. Just turning it over and over again in your mind until it starts to paint a picture in your imagination. And, and being so engrossed in and so focused on it that you unconsciously start mumbling about it. And, and it just starts to seep out of you. Uh, I, my mind goes to that scene in Lord of the Rings, the first one, where Gandalf is sitting by the fire, uh, he's got his long-stemmed wizard pipe, and he's thinking about the ring, Bilbo's ring. He's wondering if it might be uh, the one ring, the source of all their problems in Middle-earth, and uh, he, he just starts muttering to himself, like, Riddle, <coughs> riddles in the dark, my precious. It's sort of like how when I get a little too comfortable, impressions just start, of, start seeping out of me. So take that as a compliment. But in any case, Asaph shows us why we should reflect this way. In verse 13, he says, Your way, O God, is holy. Now this word, way, it brings to mind the image of a, a dusty, beaten path, like a, a road that is well-traveled. Um, if you look at a, a road uh, out in the country or um, in a place like Palestine, it's, it's, it's there because people walk on it. And they, it shows you the regular route that, people, route that people take to get to the market, to go to work, that sort of thing. It shows you the pattern of behavior the usual conduct and shows you something about the character of those who use it. So in the same way, when we reflect on God's actions in Scripture, we get a sense of his character, how he operates, who he is revealed in what he does. 
And when we immerse ourselves in that world of scripture, our mental picture of God starts to change. And this is exactly what we see happening for Asaph in verses 16 to 20, right to the end of this psalm. All of a sudden, we are transported into Asaph's imagination. Here he remembers the, exa, the, the exodus, the, that, that tumultuous time in Israel's history when God led Israel through the Red Sea out of slavery in Egypt. The scene he paints is dramatic and even violent, uh, but in the midst of it all, all this action and lightning and chaos and storm, um, Asaph is not focused on that. He's actually drawing our attention down, if you read it, down to the surface of the waters. He says, your way was on the sea. Your path was upon the great waters. There's that word way again. So this scene right here is where we truly see God's character on display. Where was God when he was rescuing Israel in the middle of chaos? He was down on the water right there with his people in the middle of the storm. Where was God on that day when the whole world felt like it was falling apart? He was amongst his people, and he was personally guiding them to safety. Here, right here, Asaph finds what he's been searching for, a full display of God's character towards his people in a time of turmoil. God, the shepherd, of his flock. And make no mistake, the Red Sea crossing was a time of unbelievable turmoil for Israel, um, arguably the first one in their history as a nation. God promised them their own land in Egypt, but then he backed them up against the Red Sea and let the Egyptians come after them. It seemed hopeless, but right there in the midst of an impossible situation. God chose to reveal himself, not only his power against the Egyptians, his enemies, but also his love for Israel, his people. See, the picture is of a God who is powerful enough to overcome the turmoil in this world, but also loving enough to meet us in the middle of it. And Asaph, when he reimagines God this way, he shows us what happens when we choose to reflect on Scripture, truly reflect on it. We find that we can rest in God's consistent character. You could say his eternal character. If God was all-loving and all-powerful for Israel in their time of turmoil, and I would say a much bigger time than Asaph is probably experiencing, he must be able and willing to meet me in mine even if I'm not sure exactly what that will look like. But there's something more for us here in this last point. As Christians, we are able to see more deeply into God's character than Asaph ever could. He lived in the Old Testament, and because of that, we can see a connection that he never was able to. Uh, in Mark's Gospel, we read that after Jesus fed over 5,000 people, he stayed on shore, and his disciples went into the Sea of Galilee. A storm kicks up, and right in the middle of it, Jesus walks out to meet them. Now at this point, Mark's Gospel adds just a little detail that I find fascinating, and I'll just read it. Mark 6, verse 48 to 50. And he saw that they were making headway painfully, for the wind was against them. And about the fourth watch of the night he came to them walking on the sea. He meant to pass them by. But when they saw him walking on the sea, they thought it was a ghost, and they cried out, for they all saw him and were terrified. But immediately he spoke to them and said, Take heart, it is I, do not be afraid. Here's the detail. Jesus meant to pass them by. Only Mark includes this. Why? Why? That's kind of an odd thing to do in that situation. I mean, did Jesus have somewhere better to be? 
Um, I mean, was was Jesus just out for his usual stroll on stormy seas, trying to catch some some ocean air, and he looks over and does a double take, like, oh, gee, not these guys again. I cannot get a moment alone even in the middle of the ocean. <laughs> That's not my finest Jesus impression. I don't think he sounded that high strung, by the way. Um, <laughs> But, but that's not what's happening here. Jesus wanted to be seen this way by his disciples and by us. He's making a point. Jesus was actually drawing our attention to this psalm that we've been reading. The only place that I'm aware of where God is described as walking on the waters. He wants us to see him as Yahweh, God, come to redeem his people and lead them in a new exodus. Except this time, he didn't just join us in the storm, he joined us in our humanity. He took our turmoil into himself, and he took it to the cross so he could create a world without turmoil, without conflict, and without chaos. So you see, while Asaph could look back to the exodus and see God's love and power on display, the Exodus actually points forward to Jesus' life, death, and resurrection, the big and full picture of God's plan. This is the picture that we must always return to in the midst of turmoil. Christ is a Redeemer who is so powerful that he's able to remake the world into a new creation. But he's so loving that he joined us in the midst of our turmoil and so intimate that he remains with us through his spirit in all the times of turmoil that we will experience until he returns. So let's go back to 18 year old Brendan, um, no longer thinking he's all that cool and no longer focused on his killer taste in music, uh, panicking in turmoil because he's driven all the way to Toronto and somehow gotten lost in the downtown core. Um, after getting sucked deeper and deeper into this vortex of one-way streets, I started to notice something. Something started to dawn on me. Some of these intersections actually seem kind of familiar. Um, hang on, I know some of these street names. Wait a minute, I even recognize some of these buildings. Then it hit me. Wait, I'm, I'm not in Toronto at all. I'm actually in London, okay? Somehow I'm actually in London. Realized after the fact that the signs over the 401 saying Toronto are actually talking about the destination, not the location. They're telling you where the 401 is leading to. And all of you are sort of like, you know, I see a lot of eyebrows going up. Like, how did you not know that? Well... Uh, this is what I mean about first impressions. You now have some blackmail material, and if we ever get into an argument, you can say, well, at least I can tell the difference between two totally different cities. But at the time, I didn't know these things. I couldn't make sense of my surroundings. But when I looked up and I started to see the pattern, the layout of London, I suddenly knew where I was, and I could hope to eventually find my way home, which I did. Um, in the same way, when we turn from our own experience, our own turmoil, to the stories of Scripture, we see the big picture of who God was, is, and always will be. And something happens to us when we refocus this way, on this picture, when we return to God's character revealed in Jesus Christ. Not only does our perception of God change, but so does our understanding of the world and even our own situation. In Jesus, we see the whole plan, the big picture, what it's all really about. And turmoil becomes just a part of that picture, not the whole thing. We can see it as process within God's plan, designed to discipline us, not destroy us. And God's plan redefines how we see our circumstances, not the other way around, which is really the root of Asaph's problem from the beginning. It just took a process to realize it. 
So when we see things this way, turmoil, it stops being a threat. It stops seeming like a threat to our faith. Instead, we, we can see it as an opportunity to grow deeper in our faith. Keep in mind that Jesus did not calm the storm and then walk out to meet his disciples. Rather, he walked out into the storm to meet them there. God often allows times of turmoil so that he can meet us in the midst, so that he can capture our attention and transform our hearts. So I want to leave you with a challenge. I don't pretend that any of this is easy uh, or, or that there isn't a process involved. This whole psalm is describing the process of turning to God in times of turmoil. But I hope that we can be challenged and encouraged with these questions for you. What's keeping you up at night? Like Asaph, what is the situation you're experiencing that doesn't quite fit with your faith, that seems to challenge it, that puts you in a state of turmoil. For many of us, it was the, having the whole world shut down three years ago in the midst of a global pandemic. Our hopes and expectations were suddenly completely at odds with our experiences, and this lasted longer than we expected. For others of us, it's the political division of our world creeping into our homes, affecting our conversations, tearing our friends and families apart. Maybe it's more personal. Maybe there's something going on in your life, a ministry that you've poured your heart into but is gradually losing steam. Uh, a loved one you've been praying for for years, faithfully, but they're still walking away from God. Um, I, the list could go on and on and on, but the point is that uh, we need to ask ourselves, where do I turn when I'm in turmoil? Uh, we're not all going to experience turmoil all the time, but we can expect to at some point and at multiple points in life. So instead of distractions or despair, do you feel comfortable offering up your pain to God in prayer? What past experiences has God given you to remind you of his faithfulness that you need to remember? What stories in scripture relate to what you're going through and can reframe it in the light of God's consistent character and help you draw closer to Christ? And, and we can all consider what practices might help us to make more space for these things, for prayer, for re remembering, for reading, for reflection. But the goal of all of this, and as it was for Asaph, so it is for us, is that times of turmoil would become opportunities for us to be transformed by the renewing of our minds. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we are grateful for the words of Asaph, for, um, for his openness and honesty in sharing his experiences, but most of all, Lord, for your faithful presence in the life of your people. And Lord, the way you turn all things to our good, you work all things for the good of those who love you, even times of turmoil where we don't know what's going on and we don't know where to turn. Um, Pray that you just impress upon our hearts that in this passage we've seen that we do know where to turn. We can turn to you. It involves a process of opening up and shifting our attention. But I pray that you would teach us through practice, through rhythm, through routine. Teach us in the course of our lives, Lord, to refocus on the face of Christ in times of turmoil. Amen.